That's scary. Well, it's like yesterday I first came to this conference. Right. It's been a long time. I was uh, doing a uh, an iPod shuffle driving here yesterday, so I had a Betty Goodman song followed by a Talking Heads song. And the number of years between Benny Goodman and Talking Heads is less than the number of years from that Talking Heads song to today. Well, Benny Goodman is the name that you saw, the name of the hall here. I did not know that. The, yeah, just, just down the hall there. Oh. The main ballroom, Benny Goodman, because he was here. I did not know that. Wow. They, they used to have a big picture of him uh-huh. there and some notes from the <laughs> Yeah. He died at age four. Benny? He had his birthday death very Glenn. young. Not I know Glenn, Glenn Miller died in the war, but I guess you're right. Yes. Well, I uh, two weeks ago in Tucson saw a blues concert with John Hammond, who is the son of the John Hammond, who discovered everybody from Benny Goodman to Stevie Ray Vaughan, including Bob Dylan in between. What a career, what a life. I, I think you're into music. Oh, yeah. Do you like jazz? Um, I heard that there was a great concert that I missed. I like it, but I missed it. And you sat next to the people who are hosting it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Lovely people. Yeah. Yeah. They said to say that. So I said to say hi to you. They didn't mention you. Okay. Yeah. Very sweet people. Yes. I am I you know, I love music. Yeah. But jazz is, is one genre that I would never buy. Mm-hmm. But on um, the other hand, these guys yeah. are such accomplished musicians yeah. that even mm-hmm. though I don't really care for the music, yeah. they are so intensely interesting to watch. Well, there is a, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Well, not intimately. Intimately. Uh, they were a comic group. A, bunch of, a couple of the guys wound up to go into Monty Python oh. ten years later. But they had in their first album a song called Jazz, Delicious Hot, Disgusting Cold. And they start out with this Dixieland jazz, you know, sort of mundane, which then degenerates as they start misplaying notes and getting out of rhythm. It's just hilarious. Right. I, I, I mean, I blame myself for the fact that I don't appreciate it. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can clearly recognize this is a very yeah. accomplished form. And right. I'm just too much of a Philistine. <laughs> don't have the education or whatever. Well, that's also true in many things. I've never gotten into opera. My parents love opera, and I've just... Um, I like it, the overtures. Yeah. Jackie, what happened to Zan? <laughs> Were you getting, yeah. you know, when do you want me to start? Do you think David's overslept? I don't know what, ha- what happened. I mean, he was, as I say, we had this one-on-one what, what was What was the debate about? Active say. Oh, okay. This is, uh, you know, it's somewhat of a hot topic since the AAA yes meeting. Mm-hmm. You know, about a month and a half ago, whatever it was. I had an op-ed, actually, about it in the New York Times 10 days ago. Okay. But I think that they planned this before that. So uh-huh. I think they decided decide about it. Right. And here it comes. Oh, he did make it. Here's David. It's okay. They're, I have I haven't been around until uh, yesterday afternoon. Good so. morning. Yeah. I was off doing other things, more important things. Uh, my name is not in the program. My name is Robert Ahrens. I'm a substitute yeah. moderator for today. This is session uh, 4111, Earth-like planets, Earthling-like aliens. Um, when I was asked to moderate on a substitute basis, they said it was a space-based topic, and I thought, well, how hard could that be? Because I work for Ball Aerospace, where we built the observatories that found all the actual planets that are formed part of the core of this. And then I was told later it was space-based aliens, and my first thought was, thank God it's not a full moon. (laughs) It is bolder. Uh, The speakers to my left is uh, Michelle Thaler. There's an extensive biography in your program, um, but I'm I'm surprised to be sitting next to her because I saw her on television a few nights ago, (laughs) randomly, and um, star of stage and screen. 
two or three times a month you'll see her on the television somewhere, Discovery, National Geographic, History Channel, that kind of thing. Turns out she's also a Renaissance dancer, and I don't suppose you're going to do an interpretive Big Bang. If you, uh, if you want to join me, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> to her left is uh, Seth Shostak. Uh, he does a radio astronomer. Uh, his work uh, has helped try and understand the ultimate fate of the universe. When you figure it out, let the rest of us know, please. He's also a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and hosts something uh, once a month called the Skeptical Check, which is a radio show, which I think would be interesting to hear. To his left is Guy Consolmagno, American-born. He's got the sweetest astronomy gig I've ever heard of. He uh, works in the uh, Vatican. He lives the La Dolce Vita of Rome. <laughs> he was the curator of the... Um, uh, Vatican's meteorite collection, and he's the recent chair of the Division for Planetary Sciences for the American Astronomical Society. And finally, at the far end is um, <clears throat> David Brin, who's an extensive writer for both fiction and nonfiction. His nonfiction work is um, called, to me, the, just re reading through things, the uh, nonfiction work called The Transparent Society examined the intersections between technology, privacy, and freedom, uh, which I think is about as forward thinking as you can get. And uh, for that work, he won the uh, Freedom of Speech Award. If you would please join me in turning off your cell phones. And uh, we're going to talk for about 10 minutes apiece, not me, them. And then at the end, we'll have uh, about 20 or 30 minutes for questions. Uh, they must be questions, not long rambling diatribes. And um, students get priorities. And with that, I give you Michelle. Thank you. Good morning. I'm a short person. Whenever I'm in a flat room and I can't see people's faces, I know to stand up. So I think I'll, I'll do that. I thought I would ease us into this conversation a little bit because, um, you know, I'm the assistant director of science at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. We have one of NASA's largest astrobiology programs there. Our Ames Research Center has a big one as well. And one of the, the true joys of my life is keeping track of the developments that are going on in this program. And uh, there was actually a, a press conference that I was supposed to be at if I wasn't here that happened a few days ago about the detection of, of oceans on many different worlds in our solar system. And uh, our chief scientist, Dr. Ellen Stofan, said that she believes that there will be proof of extraterrestrial life within the next decade. And uh, this is something that I do agree with her on. Um, I think we are getting particularly close now. And you know, now we're just sort of waiting for that last shoe to drop. So I wanted to, to give you an idea of some of the things we're searching for and just how optimistic we are that we will find life. Now, um, it may seem to you that scientists lack imagination, that when we look for life in the solar system, we look for water and carbon. And these are things that we are made of. We are basically bags of water with a bit of carbon sprinkled in. And it, 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 obviously we understand there are things you could possibly make life out of besides this. We're going to talk about methane in one example. But carbon, yes, it may be possible to have a silicon-based life form, but carbon is produced in such abundance naturally by the universe. This stuff is falling out of space on us right now. Uh, stars actually make carbon in abundance. And carbon is really, really sticky. It loves to make bonds. It's a great thing to build life out of. So while it's possible you could have life that doesn't involve carbon and water, um, there is a real reason to think that these things work very, very well. So <clears throat> let's see where we're finding carbon and water in the solar system besides the Earth. Well, of course, one of the things you've heard about is Mars. And you know, I, I, there, there are, are very few moments in life where you are absolutely overcome with joy, screaming uncontrollably and jumping up and down. And one of them was the night the Mars Curiosity rover landed for me. Um, I didn't think it was going to work. Uh, you know, when you, when you actually see these things being tested and you know what, what, what had to be skipped, when they talked about that there was going to be a crane on rockets that was going to lower this thing down to the ground, I didn't buy it. Um, Goddard Space Flight Center is in charge of one of the major instruments, the main guts of the rover, called the SAM, the Sample Analysis at Mars. And this is the instrument that actually samples the Martian soil and atmosphere and looks for building blocks of life, conditions that are favorable to life, or maybe even life itself eventually. And very quickly, uh, we, we really lucked out. We, we landed in a crater that we knew had once been wet. We could see that all the way from orbit. Our orbiting satellites could see wonderful layered strata and coastlines. Uh, we drilled into the soil and found out that it was actually fresh water that had existed there. And the soil had far more dissolved water minerals in it than we expected. It also had things like organics for the first detection of organics in the Martian soil. 
And uh, things got actually a little bit more interesting. Uh, we, we knew that there had been methane, natural gas, in the Martian atmosphere, but it seemed to kind of come and go, and we'd never seen it over in the Gale Crater area. Uh, but as the rover was, was roving around, something puffed up methane at us, and, and then the methane went away. And in fact, you can show that methane in the atmosphere of Mars will actually deplete <clears throat> in only just a couple years. So if there's methane up in the atmosphere, it has to keep being added. Now, you can get methane basically two ways. You can get it from bacterial or life processes, or you can get it from water running over volcanic rocks. You know, um, the volcanoes also produce methane. And so either way, the actual result was very interesting because we, we either have proof of some kind of activity, some kind of geologic activity under the surface of Mars, or we may have proof that there's life in the, in the soil. And, and, and what we need to show is which one of those that is. Um, another thing just happened last week, and this was actually a bit esoteric, so it didn't quite get the excitement that I wished it had. And that is we found something called fixed nitrogen compounds in the soil of Mars. And let me explain why this is interesting. I know that's kind of esoteric. Um, you may have heard about fixed nitrogen in terms of things like fertilizers. Um, nitrogen occurs naturally in planetary atmospheres. In fact, I hope you guys know what's the most common gas in the Earth's atmosphere. Nitrogen, yes. I, when you ask the public, everybody says oxygen. And you're, you're so glad that's not the case. We would have, we would have burned up long ago. Um, <clears throat> the reason nitrogen is so common in planetary atmospheres is it is really, really hard to get it out. Nitrogen doesn't react with anything. It, it, it very, very strongly bonds with itself. Two nitrogen atoms just stick together, and you can't get them apart. And one of the, the, the real first victories of the origin of life on the Earth was being able to undo these methane molecules in the atmosphere and use the methane to build more complex organic, uh, sorry, the, the nitrogen, <laughs> nitrogen, to build more complex organic molecules. So and those are called fixed nitrogen compounds. And you need a lot of energy to break up these molecules. So when, you, when we found fixed nitrogen in the soil of Mars, you can get these from meteorite impacts and lightning strikes or we believe the only other way we know of is actually through this chemical action of life. So, you know, we, again, we don't have a smoking gun. I can't tell you we found life on Mars, but we're wondering what made those fixed nitrogen compounds. Absolutely. Now, leaving Mars and going on to the outer solar system, um, this place has turned out to be a lot more interesting than we thought in terms of life potential. And in fact, when people talk about the habitable zone around a star, how close you need to be to have about the average temperature of Earth so liquid water could exist, this is kind of blowing away our idea of what the habitable zone is. Because it turns out that if you live close to a giant planet, simply the tides of that planet can keep you very warm. Jupiter is a huge planet. You know, it's a thousand times the volume of Earth, about 300 times, more than 300 times the mass of Earth. And it actually has over 60 moons. But four of those moons are wonderful major worlds unto themselves. And we believe that pretty much all of those, except for one, probably have some evidence of liquid water. Um, Io is all volcanoes, the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And that internal heat is just caused by the tidal stretching of the moons in Jupiter warming the interior of the planet. You've probably heard of Europa. Europa is a moon with a beautiful icy shell, and underneath it, from, from magnetic uh, measurements we've made while flying around Europa, we think that there's more liquid water than all of the Earth on that one moon. And uh, just about a month ago, we discovered that the largest of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede, and when you say moon, there's this kind of psychological effect of thinking of a minor thing. That's a little thing, a moon. Ganymede is almost the size of Mars. And, you know, the only reason we don't call it a, a planet, of course, is it's orbiting a bigger thing, you know, and, and that's our definition of moon. But uh, Ganymede turns out to have very active northern and southern lights, auroras. Uh, these are actually triggered by the amazingly strong magnetic field of Jupiter. And the Hubble Space Telescope has been watching the way these auroras respond over time, kind of how they slosh back and forth on the surface of the moon. And we now know there's a vast sub-ice, subterranean, I shouldn't say subterranean, sub-Ganymedean uh, liquid water ocean. And in fact, we estimate the ocean to be 60 miles deep, which is 10 times deeper than the deepest part of the Earth's ocean. And we think that covers the interior, you know, down below a layer of ice, that there's actually a 60 mile deep ocean on a planet the size of Mars. Okay, you go out to another moon of Saturn, Enceladus, and there was another press release again about a month ago. Um, Enceladus we've known has liquid water beneath the surface because there are cracks that actually jet out liquid water. 
some of these, they call them geysers. Of course, it's a different process. It's really the vacuum of space that the stuff is flying out into. But some of these geysers are twice the height of Mount Everest. And the Cassini spacecraft has been flying through the plumes and analyzing what's coming up through these liquid water vents. And there are wonderful complex organic molecules. We recently detected methane. And a little, again, a little bit esoteric, but very interesting, is we're finding the same kind of dissolved minerals that you get from very hot water undersea vents on the Earth. Uh, for those of you that know something called a black smoker, this happens when hot water gets forced up through minerals, and there's this wonderful rich water that comes up. And this may have been one of the places that life started here on Earth. Uh, we detect the exact same size and content of minerals in these geysers coming up on this moon of Saturn. So methane, organic molecules, hot water dissolving minerals, hey, I mean, now we might not even be talking microbial life. There are ecosystems here on Earth that are entirely based on these hot deep sea vents. Um, Titan is worth, you know, Titan is an amazing moon of Saturn, again, about the size of Mars. And Titan has methane lakes on it, lakes and rain. Uh, the, the surface temperature is about 350 degrees below zero, which is why methane is a liquid. But we actually know that there are, are lakes and, and there, there are shores that get exposed as the lake level rises and sinks. And um, we also know that there's liquid water underneath the frozen layer of methane. And there's some evidence of what we call cryovolcanoes, water volcanoes that are pushing liquid water up into this very organic rich environment. Organics are falling out of the sky on Titan. And uh, interesting result from a lander. Yes, we sent a lander to Titan. You know, it's, 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 sometimes people just don't know what cool stuff we've done. Uh, it was the Huygens lander uh, contributed by the European Space Agency. Um, as the lander was landing, it was measuring all the trace gases in the atmosphere. And one of the interesting gases was acetylene, because there was some acetylene in the atmosphere, and then as it went toward the surface, the acetylene disappeared. OK, well, what could do that? We really didn't know. I always love it when exploring the solar system makes you reevaluate life on Earth. Because it turns out there are some areas on Earth where there's frozen methane ice at very low temperature, very high pressure environments under the ocean, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. And there are actually something called methanogenic bacteria that get their energy from methane. And there's whole little ecosystems that eat these methane-based bacteria. And the bacteria, once we've sort of discovered these and analyzed them, they actually use a chemical to get energy out of the methane. Anybody want to guess what chemical that is? Acetylene. Acetylene. Yeah. So, you know, have we discovered an asymmetry that, that may signal that there's life there? So let me wrap up by saying, I think Brother Guy will talk about this a, a bit more, the, the building blocks of life are absolutely hugely common in, in, in the cosmos. Amino acids, nucleobases, the, 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 the clouds between the stars make far more nucleobases than you and I use in our DNA. There are far more amino acids than our proteins use. If you hold a carbon-rich meteorite in your hand, and I, I've done this so many times and kind of weirded myself out, that meteorite is far more chemically complex than your body is. One of the big challenges is not finding the building blocks of life, but seeing if we would recognize life that uses different kinds of building blocks. What if we go to Mars, but if there's a fossilized record of something that had DNA, it uses totally different nucleobases than our DNA? Would we even know it? And so we have meteorite samples at NASA that we're grinding up, and we have samples of a comet tail. And it's very romantic. You have two stories down below my office, and a little glass vial is a sample of a comet's tail that we, we flew through a comet and brought stuff back. There are amino acids in there that we don't use. There are, are, are things that could be bases for DNA that we don't use. We are cataloging those and trying to figure out how you could detect life that is very different from ourselves. I was an undergraduate at Harvard. Uh, before we actually found the first exoplanet, I worked with David Latham on trying to actually work on the technique to find these. The, pl the star we worked on, we didn't discover it while I was an undergrad, but it actually does have planets, it turns out, DM Virginis. And um, the first solar systems we found were completely different from our own. And they forced us to reevaluate the whole history and evolution of our solar system. My guess is life's going to be different, too. I bet it's going to re we're going to reevaluate what our life is like. And I'm so looking forward to the diversity of life that we find. 
And so to, to kick off Seth, what I'm going to do is, I always love this, there's, there's a, a website called Planet Quest, which tracks how many exoplanets we know of today. An exoplanet meaning a planet around another star. As of this morning, there are 5,440 exoplanets. 3,613 of those are things we need to follow up on. We, we think we saw them, but we, we need to actually have a little bit more data until we declare them absolutely certain. But 1,827 are confirmed of this morning. So that's how many planets we have to work with right now. Seth Shostak. All right. Well, I can't believe you're here at 9 a.m. Is this thing doing anything? Can you hear in the back? What a crazy question, because if you can't, you won't raise your hand. Um, there are only two questions here, right? Are the exoplanets there and are they inhabited? Well, you just heard they're there. Uh, the history of finding planets, by the way, is something that's played out in your lifetime. It's a little bit interesting. Uh, 40, 50 years ago, there was a guy in western Pennsylvania by the name of Peter van der Kamp, and he was using a telescope at the Allegheny Observatory, just looking at nearby stars, hoping to see if they moved back and forth on the sky like this because they were orbiting or were being orbited by a planet. And sure enough, he found several actually, but it turned out that uh, they were not planets. Those were trucks in Pittsburgh that were shaking his <laughs> telescope. And while, the, while this is amusing to you, it was probably not so amusing to Peter von, von, Kamp, von der Kamp because instead of being remembered forever as the guy who first found planets around another star, he was remembered for finding trucks. Okay, and then in 1993, a guy from Penn State, Alex Wolshon, actually used the uh, radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, to measure the clicks, the timing pulses coming from some nearby pulsars. And he found a couple where the, the, the speed of the pulsar would change. It would go click, 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 you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, because the pulsar was moving back and forth. There were planets around it. He was able to find planets that were even smaller than the Earth with this technique. Nobody remembers that because planets around a pulsar may not be, you know, the best places to look for life because this star exploded in their neighborhood and incinerated everything. But that was 93. The first planets around normal stars were actually found in 1995 by a Swiss, a pair of Swiss astronomers, Michel Mayor and Didier Cuilos, and uh, they found one around a, a star by the name of 51 Peg. Anyhow, that was very big news in the fall of 1995. And I happen to be, this is just an anecdotal, but I happened to be having a lunch with Michel Mayor a couple of months after this, and I asked him, I said, Michel, I hope you won't consider this an insouciant question, but I don't understand why there are any observatories, any astronomers in Switzerland. Because when you think about it, astronomy is done mostly by countries that have had a history of seafaring activity, right? Because astronomy used to be useful. There was a time when my job was considered useful, right? Uh, for, na for navigation, obviously. And if you look at, you know, what are the big powers even today in astronomy, they're the seafaring powers, right? The Britain, France, Italy, the United States, the Netherlands, but Switzerland? Did you need to navigate across Lake Geneva? What's the deal? And <laughs> Michel Mayor said, look, we've got this watch industry and they make really expensive watches and they wanted some observatories that can tell time accurately because that's something else astronomy can do so that they could guarantee that the watches were worth the money. Okay, so 1995, the first uh, planets around another uh, star were found, and then after that there's been a flood. Now, you just heard there have been thousands of planets found, or at least planetary candidates. They've not all been confirmed. Uh, Kepler has found the bulk of these, the overwhelming bulk of these, and Kepler is a space-based a telescope that was actually built largely here in Boulder, Ball Aerospace. Uh, Kepler works by just watching, it just stares at 150,000 stars 24-7 all the time. It's a staring contest, and it just notices that a couple of them, maybe a half a percent of them, will occasionally get a little bit dimmer by 0.01 percent, one part in 10,000. Get a little bit dimmer, and then, you know, so many days later they get dim again, and maybe so many days after that, the same number of days after that, they get dim again because some planet's going in front of them. Now, if you use that technique, that tells you something about the diameter and the <coughs> orbit of the planet. The diameter, because how how deep the dip is tells you how big the planet is, right? The other way to find planets, and the one that uh, Kilos and Michel Mayor and many other people since, Jeff Marcy and so forth, have used is slightly different, and that just looks for the wobble of the star, 
Okay, that's that's a hard thing to do. That that was that technique was all worked out by a couple of Canadians actually, and they were just right on the edge of being the first ones to discover planets. But then one of them decided he didn't want to be an astronomer anymore. That ended that effort. It's too bad. Uh, in any case, but that tells but that that tells you the the mass. It gives you some information about the mass. So if you combine these two techniques, which is what people do today, then you learn you learn the mass, you learn the orbital period, and you learn the size. And that allows you to compute the density of the planet, right? Is it a big puff ball like Saturn? Because Saturn, you could put in a big bowl of water if you could find one big enough, and it would flow. It's, it's all puffed out, right? <laughs> I know about it. Okay. And, <laughs> Or is it, you know, small and rocky? It's got to be made out of rocks, sort of like the Earth. So we can learn that about plants by just using these two techniques. All right, let me get to the bottom line here. The bottom line, yes, we found thousands and thousands of planets. What are they mostly like? There are a lot of big ones, but we're finding more and more small ones. It's harder to find the small ones. That's why it's taken longer. The most common type of planet that we're finding now are what are called super-Earths. And this has got to be disappointing to the residents of Boulder because they figure they live, as Professor Pangloss said, in the best of all possible <laughs> worlds. But super-Earths sound like they might be better. They're between one time the diameter of the Earth and 1.5 times the diameter of the Earth. And maybe most of them are completely covered with water, something for Kevin Costner in a bad movie. But <laughs> we, don't, we don't really know if they're covered with water, but they may have a lot of water. Super-Earths seem to be very much more common. And I note that our solar system does not have a super-Earth. We've been, we've been cheated on the super-Earth regime, okay? And how many of those planets out there are kind of like the Earth or could be habitable? That's the big, big question. Kepler has largely answered that. The preliminary statistical analysis says one in five. One in five stars has a planet that's somewhat like the Earth. One in five, that's a lot, because that means the number of somewhat like the Earth planets in our galaxy is between 10 and 100 billion. Okay, that's a big number. Okay, so let's talk just briefly about habitation. Could there be any life out there? We've already heard from Michelle a description of some of the worlds in the outer solar system that might have big oceans. If you tally it up, there are seven other worlds we know about today in our solar system that might have life. And because people are going to ask you this at your cocktail party tonight, let me just review them for you so you can quickly memorize them. Obviously, Mars. Also, Venus is a guy from Boulder, actually, David Grinspoon, who figures that up in the atmosphere of Venus, the temperatures are cool enough where you could have a settle in base life. Sounds somewhat incendiary. Okay, so there's <laughs> so Mars and Venus. Then uh, Jupiter, th the big three moons, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, all have these 100-kilometer deep oceans that Michelle has talked about. They're underneath the ground, not any sunlight, so not a whole lot of energy for life, but there could be bacteria there. And the, the thing to do is just go look for it. And then uh, Saturn, Titan, with its methane, ethane, liquid gas, uh, seas, and Enceladus with its deep ocean. So those are seven other places in our backyard where there might be life, but it's probably going to require a microscope to see that. Now, what about intelligent life? That's going to be farther away. You've heard me talk many times about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is my day job. So you know how that goes. We haven't found anything yet, but we keep looking. And of course, we've only looked at a very tiny uh, number of star systems. That's a money question. There was an interesting paper that was uh, uh, published actually, I think it was this week, and you know, the media started calling about it two days ago. And that's by a couple of astronomers in Spain who've done a very interesting statistical, a Bayesian analysis of planets and what it takes to have life. And they have not only de determined that most life is on planets that are smaller than 1.2 times the diameter of the Earth. <laughs> statistical analysis, so you know, you know, I wouldn't believe it. Ooh. I figure there's somebody standing up against the wall there. That's probably what it is. Um, but they also determine the average weight, the average mass of an intelligent alien, and it comes out to 700 pounds. Now, so don't don't expect little green men. They're going to be big green men. I'm working on it. Say, I'm working on it. And I, and I have to say that the. Uh, you know, the media are quite interested to understand why it is all the aliens are going to be the size of polar bears. Actually, it doesn't make any sense to me. I think if you're that big, you don't have to be very intelligent, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. As far as the artificial intelligence, to say something more about that, we look for artificial intel intelligence, at least up to this point, on worlds that might be somewhat like the Earth, that can produce a very diverse fauna, right? And with a lot of available energy, oxygen-based, because you get more energy that way, and so forth and so on. That's all very conservative, might be wrong. I've said about 127 times at this conference that we're only here to invent the machines. That's what we're going to do in this generation. And that most of the intelligence out there is probably synthetic intelligence. Uh, they 
don't need to be on an Earth-like planet. If you're a machine, what do you care about oceans and atmosphere and oxygen and all that stuff? You don't need all that stuff, right? But what do you need? And that's the big question for which I have no answer, but you guys are cleverer than I am, and maybe you can come up to me later and tell me how we can look for intelligence that isn't biological. Uh, I have a few ideas. Uh, they, they might be on orphan planets. Most of the planets in the cosmos are most likely not around a star. They're just wandering between the stars. They've been kicked out. Uh, they, they might just go where there's lots of energy. One thing every machine would want is more energy. So maybe we should look where there's more energy. How to find them, as I say, is difficult. But uh, just to give you the big perspective, and my final comment here, is that we talk about intelligence, and we think of it in terms of biological intelligence, soft, squishy, little gray guys with big eyeballs, no hair, no clothes. Uh, that is, I think, rather naive. Most of the intelligence, as I say, is, is synthetic. And indeed, for most of the intelligence in the universe, biology is just a faint memory somewhere in their memory banks. Guy Consul Manu. Well, you've started a trend. Um, at the University of Arizona, which is where I spend half my time, because we've got a telescope there, they have a program every year, seven or six or seven lectures, uh, sponsored by the College of Science, and this year's program was on life in the universe. And if you want to, you can go to their website, you can see the programs, the hour-long lectures that were all been recorded, and uh, see the entire scope of what how people think life arose, how we would look for it, how you can find biomarkers of life around other planets, and even Chris Impey talking about the possible search for extraterrestrial life. They asked me to give the opening lecture, and I was a little puzzled because I'm a meteoriticist. I deal with rocks. Um, I got into rocks by accident. I went to MIT in order to read science fiction. MIT's got the world's biggest collection of science fiction. And I had to choose a major. I chose Earth and planetary science because I saw the word planet and I thought, oh, yeah, that's astronomy. And only after I arrived did I discover that I'd signed up for the geology department. You know, what could be more boring than rocks? <laughs> Except rocks that fall out of the sky. Rocks that are the, the scrap from the scrap heap when the solar system was put together. So I got really into rocks in a big way. Why are they asking me to talk about life in the universe? So I got up and proposed to that group there, as I would propose to you, that really what I'm fascinated by is the mineral plagioclase. Plus, plagioclase is a very beautiful mineral. It's involved in all of these meteorites. It's formed by chains of silicon atoms that are every bit as complicated as these carbon things you're talking about. And so we should have a seven-part series on plagioclase in the universe. <laughs> and we should have this panel being, you know, exoplanets and plagioclase on those planets. <laughs> and nobody seemed to think that was a good idea. <laughs> So I'm here to ask you, why not? When we talk about biomarkers, when we talk about life, by necessity we have to talk about the chemistry that we know is complicated enough to make life as we know it run. But complicated chemistry isn't what makes life interesting. What is life? How would you even know it if you saw it? When I was in grad school, we landed this thing on Mars called the Viking Lander, and it had three experiments to look for life, and they knew exactly what they were going to look for. And if we got a result A, there was life on Mars, and if we got result B, there was no life on Mars. So, of course, we got result C. <laughs> because even the chemistry of Mars, whether or not it was life, was more complicated than we expected. What is life? And how would we recognize it? Those are two very separate questions. 20 years ago, a meteorite from Mars was analyzed and biomarkers, or supposed biomarkers, four lines of evidence were found to say that there were polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the kind of things that are left over when life decays. There are little magnetite crystals and little sulfide crystals like you get from decayed bacteria, and there were even little things that, you know, you didn't need much imagination to look like they were fossilized worms, except that they were way too small to be anything that we'd ever seen before. And the argument went on that, uh, 
you know, Occam's razor says you choose the simplest hypothesis. So you tell me, what is the simplest hypothesis? Four unusual things found together in one rock that can, have, can all be explained by one explanation, life on Mars four billion years ago. Or four lines of evidence, every one of which we can come up with a non-biological explanation for. Which is the simpler hypothesis? It all depends on your definition of what simple is. And people are still arguing about that. The, the year after this came out, a friend of mine, another media criticist, Tim Swindle, went and surveyed all the meteorite people at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. You know, do you think this evidence is worth following up? And half of the people he talked to said, well, you know, there's maybe a 10% chance there's life. That's pretty good. And the other half of the people said, there's not one ten, you know, chance in 10 that this is life. That's no good. <laughs> they both invented that same bogus you know, 10% number and came to totally different looking for life is something that is not only part of our science and necessarily informed by our science, but also something about us and why we find life interesting. Um, if we found bacteria, there would be lots of biologists and planetary scientists who would be delighted and really excited, and the general public would say, yeah, I thought they already knew that. And I'm saying that because that was the reaction when we found planets. You know, finding planets around other solar systems, around other stars, has completely revolutionized our ideas about how solar systems are formed, including our own solar system. We now are much more open to the idea that planets could have moved a lot in the early solar system and changed the way and swept parts of, of the solar system out. We would never would have believed that before. And yet, you know, he had to tell you when planets were first discovered, because probably most of you don't remember. You don't remember where you were the day that you heard that planets had been discovered. <laughs> Didn't happen. When we find bacteria, which I'm confident we will, there will be those of us ex excited, and most people will not remember where they were when that was announced. Yeah, what is it we're looking for? I've recently written a book with a, a, a philosopher co-author called Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? <laughs> and, and the subtitle really is Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial and all the other stupid questions they keep asking us at the Vatican Observatory. <laughs> uh, the, the editor made us take the word stupid out. But one thing I learned reading science fiction, and uh, David will get into this, I'm sure, Science fiction, you think of stories about the future. Science fiction is not stories about the future. Science fiction is stories about the time when the guy who wrote the science fiction story wrote the story. They reflect our own interests, our own fears, our own desires. And baptizing extraterrestrials, people have asked me that, honest to God, you know, reporters in Britain ask me that, mostly as a trick question. Aha. Uh -huh. Because if I said, yes, I'd baptize an extraterrestrial, oh, you're so incredibly arrogant. These people can fly across, you know, hundreds of light years, and you think you've got something to teach them. <laughs> or if I said, no, I wouldn't baptize an extraterrestrial. Oh, you see, Christianity is just for these yokels here on planet Earth. <laughs> Either way, I lose, right? Um, my answer, by the way, which will probably prevent you from buying the book, <laughs> would I baptize an extraterrestrial? Only if she asks. Because the point is, you know, it tells us something about what does baptism mean? What does life mean? Why do we worry about life and death? All of these other worries are projected on the extraterrestrials, but they're really worries about us. All of this searching for life in the universe is, in a sense, us searching for ourselves. And that's why it's so fascinating. And that's why it's so wonderful. I, I will end with... One bit of a historical anecdote. When I went to MIT and read a lot of science fiction, I found a professor who was as crazy as me, and crazier, he became my role model, a guy named John Lewis, who I believe you know well. And uh, at that point, this is the early 70s, John had worked out the idea that if you had a ball made of rock and ice, the rock would have little radioactive elements, Maybe under the right conditions, the ice might melt, and therefore the moons of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter could be little 
Icy Shelves, Watery Oceans, and Rocky Cores. This was published in 1971. Uh, it was all back-of-the-envelope calculation. So as a, as a master's thesis, I wrote the very elaborate project. The, the stack of cards was that thick. That's how elaborate it was. And for making all sorts of assumptions that have turned out to be wrong, I was able to show that, yes, indeed, Europa would have a, a crust, an ocean, and a core. And I published this where the, the ocean would be 100 kilometers thick. Why? Because the grid size that I use in my models was 100 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen this number quoted ever since, usually as 60 miles thick. Like, you know, that was actually the grid size. At the And, and of course, at that time, this is when Carl Sagan was rising in fame and power. And, and uh, John Lewis would, of course, make endless fun of Carl Sagan, as you do with people who you both admire and are incredibly jealous of. So having learned from him, I wrote at the end of my thesis, you will have water, you will have rocky material and water bubbling through the rocky material. There is the great potential of interesting organic chemistry occurring in these oceans. However, quoting myself, I will stop short of postulating life in these oceans, leaving that for others more skilled in such things than myself. So you are looking at the first person in print to not predict life in the oceans of Europa. <laughs> um, I actually had a chance to talk to Carl about it, and he says, well, there's, there's no sunlight. How could you ever have the energy for life? That was before we knew about the, dark, dark, the black smokers. But I did try to write a science fiction story of what it would be, life to be an like to be an intelligent tuna <laughs> in a planet that has a rocky core and an icy shell. Because if you lived in that universe, your universe would have a bottom and a top. And you could go swimming around and around and around forever, but you would never know that you were orbiting a planet. You would never know that that planet was orbiting a star. You would never know that there were other stars out there until maybe an impact occurs, you're the water bursts you up into the surface and you have one last chance before you freeze to death to see the universe full of stars. Makes you wonder, what are the limits of our universe that we can't see beyond? David Brin. How in the world do you follow acts like that? <laughs> Well, um, I, this is uh, living proof uh, to me that I'm okay because I talk so much and now I realize it's just to fill vacuum because um, I've, I, I, I've heard all that I want to hear, so bye. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, thank you very much, for uh, Seth, for reminding me of the words Kevin Costner. <laughs> He made a movie of my novel, and all I got was this stupid, no, never mind. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there will be a panel on religion and, and science later on in this room. I think it's next. Yep. Um, and so we'll pursue some of the issues um, that Guy brought up. Um, and it's, it is quite fascinating how... Um, some of our interests in cosmology, where we came from, where we're going, are um, both altering and yet rooted in the same impulses, the same things within ourselves um, as, we, as we become, uh, well, to put it very assertively, co-creators, uh, as we develop the ability to meddle in, um, in, in the creation of a life forms, which is the other side of this question. Because as we search for other life forms, we're at the same time um, making them in the, in the laboratories. And these two sciences uh, play against each other. Um, I married a meteoriticist, fortunately better looking, but um, <laughs> uh, 
she worked under Jerry Wasserberg, which she was the only um, female graduate student ever to survive him. Uh, so I was very pleased by that. Now the, the roofed worlds, uh, I call them roofed worlds because they are um, ice covered. And uh, our friend John Lewis predicted that. Not only that, but uh, also the notion that we might mine the sky. Uh, John Lewis was the um, sort of godfather, uh, eminence gris, of planetary resources, which is uh, an industrial organization of some Silicon Valley uh, zillionaires who want to go forth and characterize and discover more about asteroids in our solar system and eventually reach the point where we can mine them. First by putting a baggie around an asteroid and letting the sun heat it up and co then collecting the water. Because water is the most expensive thing we launch into orbit. $15,000 a pound and they need it out there, the, the astronauts. If you could get a huge supply of water out there, then uh, colonization becomes possible. You split water in half using sunlight, you've got hydrogen, oxygen, you've got rocket fuel. And above all, you find a place with gravity and you've got a swimming pool. <laughs> But uh, at, later on, when you see you've learned how to live and work in space, then you can start, uh, if you take yet one one kilometer across asteroid, and there are millions of them, of the right kind, I think I mentioned this yesterday, you would get the entire world's steel production for a year and the entire world's gold and silver production for 100 years, causing the prices to go down. So don't <laughs> uh, dump those stocks when you see these guys getting close. And of course, this has become the focus of the Obama administration's choice of where, what we're, we're, we're aiming our space program, the manned portion of the uh, human portion of the space program. Um, and uh, most of the scientists agree that it's a lot more interesting and more likely to bear fruit than going back to the sterile um, gravity well of the moon. Now, um, there are some aspects to these roofed worlds. And that is that there's some belief that a Ceres might have. Now, you might be puzzled. Ceres, the, the, um, the other great dwarf planet than, than Pluto, which will be streaking past in July. You, you and you, the three of you, not the rest of you. Um, you helped make this happen. Um, Ceres is the largest asteroid, but we now consider it a dwarf planet. It's fully spherical and all that sort of thing. Um, it may have buried oceans also. But how? It's not orbiting a, a giant moon, the tugging ties on it. Well, there have been, there have been some very interesting um, advances in, in notions about how you might be getting this energy. And in fact, you need an additional energy source for Enceladus uh, because the tides aren't that strong. And one of the things that's come up uh, lately is the notion of uh, serpentine, one of the min mineral forms. To heck with plagioclase. Uh, <laughs> them's fighting words. Uh, that serpentine, I think it's a version of olivine, right? Yep. Um, when it condensed in the early solar system, it condensed in a higher energy form. And over the course of a billion years, five billion years, it relaxes into a lower energy form releasing heat. In exactly the same way, the same mathematics of half-lives as with radioactivity. So radioactivity could be heating these, um, these moons um, and also a mineral shift. Um, really, really weird. Titan, I've been working on a short story, more of a novella uh, set there in which we uh, send explorers, they land. I think the sexiest photo we ever got from space is the Huygens probe coming in and showing us a shoreline of an ocean with river valleys. And the ocean is, is, is methane and ethane, and the, the hills are solid rock ice and covered with wax. And so the beings on this world are very slow and they're wax beings and they, they see us come out of our space ships and they realize that we are just like the enemy from below that they've been fighting for <laughs> millions of years, the, the beings made of molten water. <laughs> and they think we're going to come down inside with their enemies and we say, 
Oh, those guys? We find them everywhere. You're interesting. You're made of wax. Anyway, a little bit of a sci-fi riff there. <laughs> but um, one th quick thing about Kepler. Why has Kepler found so few solar systems? You're know, thinking, what are you talking about? Kepler's found fantastic numbers. It was made on a shoestring. And different three people, you, you, and you paid for Kepler. Um, well, Kepler only sees solar systems in which the ecliptic is edge on to us where the planets would pass in front of their star. So we have to use mathematical methods to extrapolate from that how likely it is that all the others, <laughs> um, and, and what the numbers would be, because this only gives you about 5% of the solar systems, and in that case, mostly the um, planets that are close in. So there's a selection effect in what we're discovering. And then they have to use mathematical tools to then guesstimate what the other solar systems might be like or what my, things might be like farther out. Now, uh, Seth spoke about non-biological intelligences, and this segues into what's called the singularity. Have any of you heard of that? The notion that we may be building our successors. And there's nothing absolutely wrong with building the intelligent life forms that are smarter than you that will replace you. I see several of them in the room, students here, <laughs> the barbarians that we call the next generation. Uh, in this case, we are very proud because probably the best thing we boomers can say about ourselves is that we made you because <laughs> you're so much better than us. But um, if we were to raise you right, then you don't, most of you don't go around saying, destroy all humans. <laughs> and if we raise the new AIs right, perhaps they'll pat us on the head, tell us the latest joke from work, and then, <laughs> then confuse us terribly with what it, they, it is they do for a living. <laughs> go, go fishing with us and then head off and, and bring the grandkids <clears throat> by uh, every now and then. And so what's changed? You know, can be confused approving grandparents. If it's like that, then I think we can probably consider it to be a soft landing. Uh, on the other hand, it could be destroy all humans. Let's, let's work on that. Uh, in my latest novel, Existence, I portray us encountering what are called von Neumann self-replicating probes in the asteroid belt. And I agree with Seth call the newspapers uh, <laughs> on this point that the, uh, it is likely um, that a large fraction of what we find out there will be self-replicating robotic probes because they're an easy and cheap way of sending messages and um, intelligence and activity throughout the cosmos. I was part of a conference back in the 80s where we calculated that if you send one very, very sophisticated self-replicating probe to a nearby stellar system, it reports on the system, sends back information, and then it finds an asteroid, mines it, and makes 100 copies of itself, fuels them up with local resources, sends them on. Each of them does the same thing at successive solar systems. You would then fill the galaxy in 30 million years. 30 million years. Wait a minute, no, it was three million. It was three million years. It was 60 million years if we do it ourselves using colony ships. Which raises the key question, how many of you were at the um, thing uh, last, yesterday at, in the Mackey when Seth and I um, did not need the EMT trucks um, after we were through with each other? Um, the, the notion that um, that it is possible that life could pervade the galaxy, which make exacerbates a pair of words that Seth doesn't like and that I find very thought-provoking, and that is the Fermi paradox. And that is the notion that, that Fermi asked, uh, Enrico Fermi asked back in the 40s, and that is, so where the hell are they? And Seth would answer, we just haven't expanded our search enough. So let's get money into SETI so we can expand it. They can improve their hardware by a factor of 100. And then they'll say, we need a factor of 100 improvement because we just haven't looked far enough. The operating 
Um, the operating tool that we use for discussing this question is called the Drake Equation. How many of you have heard of that? A lot of these nature shows, they show it. Um, it's a way that Fra our friend Frank Drake came up with for doing a back of the envelope thought experiment. Not actually calculating, but you take the number of planets that we guess in the universe. And that uh, 20 years ago, this was just a number we pulled out of the air. Now we have a much better idea. You multiply that by the fraction that you estimate have equable carbon and water um, environments, the fraction of those that develop life. And every year in the laboratory, we chip away at the bulwarks of those who say that we can't do it or that it's hard to do, it's hard to make life. But still, some of the gray zones may contain something that requires something highly unlikely. The fraction of those worlds that develop intelligence. And here you're starting to get into it, some areas where in my cataloging, because that's what I consider to be my job, not to come up with one explanation. It, it seems silly in the greatest scientific topic without any subject matter. Um, but in the tabulation of these explanations, I believe that uh, F sub I, the fraction that develop technological capable intelligence, I think there's some real meat in there. It may be that we are exceptional. Or the fraction of those that develop detectable technology. The lifespan of such a species as a detectable civilization. Carl Sagan concentrated on this. He said that unless they tame their aggressive tendencies, L will be short. And this is the quandary we face right now. Not just nuclear winter, which was his emphasis, but also being able to solve our ecological management problems, to be good planetary managers so that L can be expanded. And we have a lot of diverse descendants, not just our own children or AIs that think of themselves as our children, but as I portray in some of my novels, uplifting dolphins and chimpanzees to make them fully sapient members of our civilization, or uh, other diverse, the diversification of what it means to be human, because our children will choose um, different environments and different types of, of people. So if we don't meet aliens, we'll simply make them, because we have that hunger of spirit to expand horizons. Uh, and L could have a limit on the other end that's not so bad, um, an advanced life form may transcend into some modality that it's hard for us to detect. Um, I had a novel, Heart of the Comet, in which we talk about how humans may colonize comets. And then they settle the galaxy by simply drifting into the Oort clouds of other stars. Really slow migration, but it could fill the galaxy. Well, then you need an added Drake factor of how likely it is you're even going to detect such a civilization. And a cometary civilization could be very old, and we're very unlikely to detect them. We may have been seeded with life from comets. It turns out that at the early solar system, there was a lot of aluminum-26 around radioactive elements. As the comics, comets formed, and there were trillions of them out there, um, they formed a perfect test tubes with ice on the outside, heated liquid water in the inside, all these wonderful salts and carbons and other stuff cooking inside, more actual volume of cooking water and carbon than, it, than in all of the roofed worlds in all of Earth. And that may have been the panspermia source of life that then rained down on Earth. So there's so many possibilities there. But as you go through the Drake equation, and I urge you to look it up, you realize that any of these could be small, smaller than we expected, and that could explain why things seem fairly sparse out there. I didn't mention the last part, because Drake didn't mention uh, either the visibility quotient or this last one, and that's expansion speed. How rapidly does a civilization that reaches technology expand to other star systems? 
I just described how easy it would be for them to send out probes that replicate themselves. And so the question then is made even rougher by where the hell are they? Because now we're not just talking about one source of life that we've been piercing, sifting through what they call the cosmic haystack, you know, to see if we can hear something here. Or in, in some cases, I believe foolishly, shouting at that part right there. Yoo-hoo! But the, the notion that instead of one place where they evolved, there might be thousands or tens of thousands to which, at which they've reached by now. Time. So um, last thought here, and that is that this velocity of the expansion of the ship, of the wave, is something that also some people think that's responsible because they set the ship speed at zero. So this is the vast spectrum within which you can put all of this and look up the Drake equation. And only one last cavil here for, for, um, for my colleague here, um, Guy, and that is that um, a lot of science fiction authors aren't thinking about the present when they write. <laughs> We're thinking about the mistakes we might make tomorrow. We have about 20 minutes here for questions, and I remind everybody the students do get a priority. I'd like to start by making a, an oblique comment about the plagio class conference idea. That is so MIT. <laughs> Speaking as a Caltecher, I totally agree. <laughs> when will we find Earth-like moons of Jupiter-like planets in life zones of other stars? The gentleman makes a good point, and perhaps you've uh, extracted this from the discussion today. We think of life being only on planets, but of the seven other worlds in our solar system that might have life, very few of them are planets, only two. Okay. So the idea of life on moons is very au courant, and the, the, the gentleman asked, when will we be able to find those big moons around other planets, like Pandora, right, if you're into blue aliens. Uh, it's, it's very unclear. That's, that's a very hard thing to do. There are some techniques that could do it if you had bigger instruments. So again, something within the next 20 years, it's a matter of building the right big telescope. But, but the methods by which the NASA uh, head of research a few days ago said that we might find life um, in other solar systems, those methods would be very, very difficult to apply to icy moons in other solar systems because they're, they involve the starlight passing through the atmosphere of some other planet. Um, so we're more likely to discover uh, traces of life that uh, Michelle was talking about um, from the spectrum of the sun light passing through atmospheres. Isn't that right? That's what we're hoping JWST will do to some extent, the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, James Webb will, will actually not have the capability. I mean, I mean finding exomoons is a big deal. That's something we talk about a lot at NASA. Um, it, it probably will not have the capability to do that. In fact, one of the things we're modeling for the James Webb Space Telescope is how to decouple the light signature of, of a bright moon, like our moon to Earth. You know, that if we just get, I mean, we're not going to get pixels. We're not going to be able to see these things separated. So how do you know which light is coming from the moon of a, of a system versus the planet of a system? So JWST, we hope, will see light filtering through the atmospheres of exoplanets, and we can detect things like oxygen and water vapor. Um, it, it, one of the kind of interesting trivia things is that the smallest planets that Kepler has detected are about the size of Jupiter's moons. There's actually one system where the star itself is not physically much bigger than Jupiter, and we've detected little planets around that that are actually not much larger than the, uh, the moons of Jupiter. So yeah, th we're, we're hot on the trail of that. That's going to be a tricky one. There's another you know, point that I think uh, a lot of people forget. It's obvious to us, so obvious we don't even mention it. They talked about uh, confirmed versus unconfirmed planets. Well, a confirmed planet means that we've seen it three times. Now, you see it when it passes in front of its star or it's pulled at its star. Jupiter takes 12 years to go around once. So you'd have to be observing for 24 years before you could even confirm that Jupiter was around our sun, if you were at some distant place looking back at us. There is a lot of stuff out there that we know must be there, and we just haven't been looking long enough.
Let me move on to the next question because he was first. Even though you get priority, he was first. Sure, first yeah, him and then you two yeah. students. That'll be fine. Go ahead, sir. Can I just very quickly that you know, there's a wonderful graphic that JPL released yesterday about all of the different uh, objects we think have oceans in our solar system. It may surprise you to know what's on there. Uh, so, I mean, th this is all a little bit conjectural. But we talk about Ceres, the largest asteroid, but the other ones are Mimas, Triton, and Pluto as possible places for liquid water. So, I mean, things are getting, things are increasing all the time. Plutonians. Question, please. Uh, three simple questions. Uh, one from Michelle. Um, it, it, Evolution requires constant energy input. You, um, the ones, the two that I know are thermonuclear and um, geological. You seem to be suggesting others on Jupiter's moons. The second question is if you take convergent evolution and um, from a chemical to a biological standpoint and list the convergent evolution that occurs on Earth, can you make any statements about what extraterrestrial beings look like. Um, and then the third question is, the solar system has a huge um, variety of temperatures and pressures um, that have been going on for five billion years. We seem to know very little about that. Is that the case? So quickly. <laughs> okay, I guess the first one, uh, uh, what, what evolution needs is a voltage. Evolution needs a, a, a difference in energy states. That's all it needs. It doesn't have to be any particular thing. Uh, in the case of black smokers under the ocean, that's a chemical gradient. You can have different chemistry. You can have different acid levels. You can have different temperature levels. So, you know, there, there's so many ways to get an energy voltage that molecules can grab hold of and use to start self-replicating and off you go. So, you know, no, I don't think evolution's particularly hard to kick off. I mean, one of the neat things about black smokers is life is probably originating there today. It's just that right now all the different energy niches and levels are already filled by things. There was no moment of genesis that this is an ongoing process whenever you have an energy gradient. Just, just very briefly on convergent evolution. People ask all the time what will the aliens look like, and they always come back to convergent evolution, that they will look something like us because we're a good design for an intelligent creature. Now, that, that may be a little bit too self-centered, actually, but the idea that they might have eyes and a head and that kind of stuff, that just makes good engineering sense, that, so that may not be too crazy. The idea that they're the weight of a polar bear, that's based on mathematics. You can believe that if you wish. All right, let's go to this lady over here for her question. Yeah. Uh, I, I suggest you look at the diversity of life forms that happened in the Cambrian explosion uh, and so many different kinds before they got winnowed down to the arthropods and us as vertebrates. Um, and there were a, was a wide variety of types. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you guys for being with us today. You guys are fantastic. So my question, <laughs> my question is that on Mars, they've been talking about evidence of an atmosphere that used to be there sometime around the beginning of our solar system. And then about 3.8 billion years ago, there was some cataclysmic event that destroyed it. So my question is, what is it that we look for when we look for atmospheres or atmosphere composition, or maybe atmospheres that were there and aren't there anymore? What, where do we start in that search? Um, well, one piece of evidence is simply the evidence that there was liquid water flowing on the surface and then you attempt to estimate how old are the landforms that had the liquid water and was the liquid water long term or did it just sort of rain down, make some channels and then evaporate away. So that's the, the first place that people looked that gave people the idea to think about it. When you've got samples you can also look at the oxidation state. How much are they oxidized? How much have they been chemically altered by water? And is there a correlation between that and the age of the samples? Michelle, isn't it true that they now believe that the um equable period on Mars lasted much longer than that. Yeah, I was about to say, we, we just uh, arrived at Mars with the MAVEN spacecraft last year. That's the Mars Atmospheric and Volatile Evolution Mission. And we are actually monitoring the current leakage of atmosphere away from Mars. Um, we, it's still ongoing, right? This is this, this was not necessarily a cataclysmic event. Um, what, what, what happened is that Mars does not have a magnetic field that protects it from solar weather. So every time you get a good solar storm, stuff just gets basically blasted off. And there's other more subtle processes that I'd be happy to talk about at length. But, you know, we, we have extremely good proof that Mars had a, had a, a livable environment much more recent than that. The 3.8 billion years, the reason that's significant is that's the first example of life 
evidence we have on Earth is 3.8 billion years ago. And 3.8 billion years ago, we know for a fact that Mars had substantial oceans and atmospheres. We don't think that that's when they leaked away. They, they, the, 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 real, the real thing now is are we talking about 2 billion years ago, 1 billion years ago, half a billion years ago, that it was actually uh, uh, liquid water could exist on the surface? Gentleman in the blue shirt. So my question is, as our scientific horizons change and as our cultural fears and desires change, how do you think the genre of science fiction will change? Well, one of the problems has been that uh, some of the things we were confident would be 20, 30, 40 years in the future, like in my latest novel, augmented reality glasses that overlay things as you're walking around, uh, start showing up. Uh, two, three years after your novel's finished, and, and, and sometimes while you're writing it. Uh, um, and this has had an intimidating effect, unfortunately, on a lot of the bright young writers veering away from predictive or warning science fiction. And we're trying to counsel them and say, have some guts. Uh, don't, don't, don't go over to fantasy. <laughs> One of the uh, fascinating things is to read the stuff that I read when I was in college and a book that I keep coming back to, John Brunner's Stand on Zanzibar, which was set in the year 2010. I modeled two novels after that. And, and he wrote existence. it in the, in the late 60s. Yes. When I read it in the early 70s, it was such a dystopia that I, I was horrified. And he basically got it right. Uh, except that it was filled also with hope. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which is the balance. I highly recommend it, Stand on Zanzibar. He based the multimedia approach in that book on, on uh, USA by Dos Passos, and I based two novels on exactly on mm -hmm. that book. But, but the point is, whether he got it right or wrong, what you have to get right in a novel is the human element. If it's filled with people who are nothing but cardboard cutouts that you're moving around to make the point that you've got to make because nobody's been smart enough to know this until now, it's going to be a terrible book. Uh, for those of you interested in planets and aliens, some of the great classic science fiction is by a uh, high school chemistry teacher named Hal Al Clement. Clement. Uh, and he will take you to a world of ammonia or methane and show you what the aliens might be like, except they think just like us. Right. Let's go to the gentleman no, here the, in the green shirt. No, oh, oh, I didn't see her back oh, there. I'm sorry. No, no, you've been patient. Go ahead, ask your question. All right. And then um, she's next. Yeah. I, I'm wondering. Uh, First of all, it's my understanding that if you lose an arm and a leg from an accident, it can be replaced by one that is driven not by muscles but by motors with internal rechargeable batteries and things. How long will it be? Will our grandchildren, for example, live in an age in which our technology allows us to completely construct a human being in a laboratory with a computer brain that will have all the characteristics of our brains now in which we could perhaps, rather than dying from biological death, choose to have the contents of our brains transferred to one that's built to look like us and will live forever. Ray Kurzweil. Just look up anything by Kurzweil. You'll find all your answers you need. <laughs> K I don't agree with him in all things, but, but he'll take you off on this trip, and it'll be a roller coaster. I, I think are. There, there's several parts to that. Uh, creating you know, human-like beings in the laboratory, many grad students have tried that experiment, actually. <laughs> but in, in, in terms of you know, prosthetics, you're right. That's today. Uh, in terms of printing you know, replaceable organs, that's been the subject of discussion here at the conference, and that's also almost today. But in terms of producing an entire human, but with a, uh, if you will, synthetic brain, uh, you know, it, it may not pay to do that. Why would you want to do that? If you can make the synthetic brain, why don't you get rid of the human part that's only going to hold you back? So I think it's much more likely you'll have the brain in the jar sitting on the table, and it I, won't, won't be like you. I, so, I, they'll, so they'll pat us on the head and call us gramps <laughs> instead of destroy all humans. That's the reason. Young lady in the red pants, just speak into the microphone. You'll have to bend it down so we can hear you. There you go. So this question's for Seth. Seth? Mm -hmm. So what would happen if we encountered an alien race but we were not able to communicate with them? Like if our greeting was, 
is they're meant declaring war in their language. Like, how would we deal with that? Yeah, you know, that's really a good question because, of course, in the movies and on TV, the aliens always have a great command of English. <laughs> and there's, there's some likelihood they may not. Uh, they may not even speak. I mean, maybe they don't talk, uh, although if they're on a planet with an atmosphere, they probably do talk. But, uh, but that's a very, but you know, you can answer that question by looking back to 1492. You know, Chris Columbus lands on some godforsaken island in the Caribbean, and there are, there are people there, they're intelligent beings, and they don't share any language. And how do they communicate? They wave at one another, they judge by their actions. So if the aliens land here and you don't understand them, but they start, you know, to incinerate the planet, then at least you, you know what they were intending to do. Yeah. There was, and I have one more question. So is it possible that there could be an, that aliens could be like, is it possible that they could be controlled by a certain central organism and then there are several, and then there are hundreds of underlings? Brother Guy says the Borg. Is that what you mean, the Borg? Um, I was thinking more like the Zerg, but I don't know the Borg. Why do they always end in G? I don't get it. Well, do they, on, Earth, on Earth, a wide variety of organisms <clears throat> converged towards, uh, what's it called, Michelle? The, the, the bee-like thing that the... Um, Hive the, intelligence. Yeah, well, yeah but, but what's, what's the... I wanted to be impressive, the Latin thing. The, um, it turns out a mammalian species moved towards this uh, attractor state of life, of having queens and all that, the naked mole rat. Uh, and ironically, they are also uh, the mammalian species that's completely immune to cancer. Um, so it's quite possible that converging toward a pyramidal structure of 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 eusocial of a eusocial hive like queen based life form is possibly an attractor state that they would go towards i think that's the end result of feudalism if we ever go back to it let's okay. move on to the oh go ahead sorry no, go ahead, say, i love naked mole rats they are so cool yeah. excellent intelligent questions by the way if and when uh, life of any kind is found and confirmed, how will that change humanity's conception of ourselves going forward into the future? Permanent changes. I've actually, uh, the most startling answer to that that I'd heard was, I believe Michael Crow, but I asked Michael Crow if he said that and he said he didn't, but I still think I, I read it in one of his books, <laughs> that the result would be almost no change because most people already expect it to happen that I like finding planets elsewhere. By the time we do find intelligent life, yeah, well, it's about time, any life, yeah. but any, any life at all, it'll affect the scientists a lot. Because up to now, all of these speculations, whether it's the mole rats, or, the, or we're all extrapolating through one data point. And you could fit any line you want in any direction when you only have one uh, example to fit. Having more than one example gives us a better sense of what is life. You know, if the only tree you ever saw was the palm tree on the desert island that you lived on, would you recognize that, when, that an oak was also a tree? You've got to have lots of different kinds of trees before you know what's essential to treeness and what isn't. I think the same is true of life. But to be perfectly honest, if we found the intelligent, you know, the signal from the intelligence, it would be a three-day wonder, and then they'd be worried about uh, you know the, the basketball again. I, 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 I know, it, it, in my case, I have champagne chilling. You know, I mean, it's going to happen one of these days that we'll find the bacterial life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're getting very close. And there will be a, a wonderful party and, and wonderful academic celebrations, but I agree. I think it's a three-day news thing. And then people will go on with whatever else is the distraction of the day. I mean, I mean, one of the things to remind you about is that, I mean, do you realize that if there's anybody here, and there are some people here that are younger than 15 years old, um, th there have been people in space continuously for the last 15 and a half years. You know, there was a time when that was really worth noting. You know, there were people up in space, you know, up in orbit. Um, and now nobody even thinks about it. The space station has been continuously occupied for over 15 years. And it's you might us. also take the historical precedent, those of you who remember 1996, the biggest science news story, the Martian meteorite. Big news, Ooh. giant headlines in the New York Times for three days. Very little comment. Yeah, done. And I think my, my panel mates are much too contemptuous of the average <laughs> American. I'm on your side. Look at the, how packed this room is. The fact of the matter is that uh, those of us who are in the community of wonder make up a very large fraction of this nation's population. 
those who watch the, the TV shows, even those who can't really parse between the ones that have Michelle on them, and then right followed by Ancient Aliens. <laughs> it nevertheless, they're watching both shows because they're passionate about it. What I feel has happened is that folks like you are a bit intimidated and you were raised by the archetype theme of our generation, which is Peter Finch in Network screaming, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and I have a YouTube, I have a TED talk uh, in which I, I, I attack this. And I say, when you have, when you have paid with $1.95 of your taxes to orbit Ceres, in two months, pass by Pluto um, to, to watch a comet pass by the only planet we know that's in inhabited entirely by robots. Uh, it, it, it land on a comet. And to do all of those things is to be a mir miracle civilization. And the second miracle is that we've managed to make it boring. <laughs> and I believe that it's time to push back against the bullies who've been bullied us into pretending we don't care, who pre into only a few people like Michelle and me that same night, getting out on the balcony and screaming, I'm as proud as hell, and I'm not going to take your damn cynicism anymore. We're, we're, we're down, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. We're down to our last two minutes. I have a hard stop here at 20 after the hour. So the young man in the orange shirt here, you'll need to bend that microphone down a little bit. What would you do if alien colonizations threatened to destroy the Earth? <laughs> Cry. Yeah, ju just enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> not, there's not much you can do. It's, it's, it's like the, the U.S. military meeting the Neanderthals. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Um, I've got some links and some references for books that have explored this concept in clever ways right. we can deal with it. Maybe in the last minute and a half here, you've been patient. Um, quick question for Seth. How much has SETI actually explored of our galaxy and or universe? Yeah. Uh, the number of star systems have been looked at carefully over a wide range of frequencies is a few thousand. In the optical, looking for flashing lights, also a few thousand. So, you know, the whole sky's been looked at at a very rough level, if you will. Very rain, a small range of frequencies, very poor sensitivity. The number that have been looked at carefully is a few thousand in a galaxy of a few hundred billion star systems. So, in the usual analogy, it's, it's like going down to the, the Pacific, taking one glass of water and say, you know, I've sampled the ocean. Oh, man, I don't know what, the, where's the producer? Do we, can we do one more? You want to do a, you go well, ahead. Uh, the it, next panel starts in this room at 11, so. No, they told me it was done at 10.20 um, is what yeah, I was saying. Yeah, yeah, but I think, we have to do yeah. Is, yeah. two minutes, all right, go ahead, gentlemen, go ahead. Is it a given that life elsewhere will consist of cells with chromosomes, genes, Cell division, genetics, survival of the fittest, of evolution, or is that not a given? A lot of that is very likely. Evolution is very likely because you think about any system that doesn't have evolution is going to be taken over by one that does. The other things are kind of up for grabs, some of them. I mean, it's not necessarily going to have DNA. In fact, it's pretty unlikely. But it may very well have cells because cells, you know, having those cell walls means you can contain the chemistry and you can let it go much, much faster and, you know, it doesn't dilute into the ocean, stuff like that. I mean, who's the biologist on the panel? Yeah. <laughs> I, I point out that uh, some people have argued that, in fact, life came from Mars, was formed there, and came to Earth, which would mean that there would be, you know, the sort of same sort of life in both places. The best evidence for that is that the Martian day is 24 hours and 39 minutes long. And this morning, didn't you really need another 39 minutes to... <laughs> There's, there's yeah. also, I mean, it's conjectural, but there's also the idea of the oxidized molybdenum, you know, being more prevalent on Mars. It, it, it's, it's conjecture, but some people think that Mars was the better environment for evolution to take hold. And we have Martian meteorites that could very well have brought over the seeds of life. I mean, and it has less than half the gravity, and for those of us over 50, half the gravity and an extra hour every day. Let's just hope we don't do to this, our adopted world, what we did to our home world. <laughs> Uh, two quick things. I've been asked by the uh, moderator or the uh, producers, if you leave the room and you're free to do so, you, the side doors over here are not the back doors. 
And then this question, and then Dr. E. Rocker, and we'll call it a wrap. Thank you guys for coming. I have two quick questions for you. One is, what is your opinion? I believe it is referred to as the wow signal that was picked up by SETI. And also, what do you think is the possibility that uh, extraterrestrial life has already came to this planet and been like, these people are, this species is violent and dangerous and we don't want anything to do with them? You know what? Uh, there's a guy, E.O. Wilson, he studies ants. They're really violent. They go to war with one another. It's still worth studying. So I, I don't buy into this business. We're, we're, we're too evil for the aliens. So I, I don't buy into that. As far as them having come here before, uh, you know, it's, there's no evidence that I consider very compelling. But, you know, if they landed 100 million years ago, took a, picture, a couple of pictures of dinos and so forth, and then left, how would you know? So, so you really don't know. And the, the other question was about the wow signal very briefly. That was 1977. It was found at Ohio State University, which at the time still had a radio telescope until they turned it into a golf course. Uh, but, but that's Ohio, all right? All right. So, and, and it was found uh, by a telescope that was automatically scanning the sky every day. And one morning, uh, Jerry Amen, an astronomer there, he comes in, he looks at the computer printout, and he sees a really big signal, and he writes, wow, with a magic marker next to it, wow. Now, so that has become famous, but that's the triumph of marketing over product. Because at the same era, there were hundreds of signals that were found that were just as convincing as the wow, but nobody wrote wow or something clever next to it. And if they had, maybe those would be famous. The thing about the wow signal is you can believe it was aliens. The guys at Ohio State tell me it was probably terrestrial interference. But it was only found once, and that antenna had a second receiver on it that allowed it to see that same part of the sky at the same spot on the dial, 70 seconds, one minute, 10 seconds later, and didn't see the wow signal. It's been looked at by a guy in Chicago for decades ever since with much better instruments never been found again so bottom line say what you want about the wall but wow but if you only find something once in science it could be a mistake so you can't get the Nobel Prize for that hey, you had to turn it upside down and it was mom <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I had a question. We Into the microphone, please. It's being recorded. Okay. We know a lot about the environments of these icy moons. Can somebody uh, speculate about which moon would be the best one to visit first and, and <laughs> why? Oh, wow. I mean, that's sort of like choosing between your children. It, it's also uh, a lively debate at NASA. We do not agree on this, and that's fine. I mean, once we get something funded, we all sort of you know, lock in behind it and support it. But especially the Enceladus versus Europa debate has been a really, really lively one. Because Enceladus is farther away. There's probably less water. But the water is, is actually breaking through the surface. It's probably easier to access. And you don't have the radiation environment of Jupiter. Jupiter has such a huge magnetic field that when you send a spacecraft to explore the moons of Jupiter, you're basically living inside a particle accelerator. So sending a probe to Europa, one of the really, really big problems is radiation hardening that thing enough to have any time to be there. So there's, there's been a real lively debate between Europa and Enceladus. I mean, th those two especially. And, uh, you know, I mean, Mars, I think we've decided, was a major a, a candidate for life. So I mean, we're definitely prioritizing Mars. Europa is what we've gotten funding from Congress to actually get a mission started. So I think we're going to start with Europa. I, I might have actually voted for Enceladus. But, uh, but now that we got, I'm glad we got the Europa mission. So yay. Last question. OK, just a. An example here, and I want to comment on it. When Al Gore's movie about climate change came out, Human Caused Climate Change, there was a big flurry of news media and so on. That's faded away pretty much. Is that an example of the short time you'd expect when someone finds life? Maybe it'll last 10, 20 years rather than three days, but. Oh, well, we're talking about climate change, certainly. Yeah, but we don't and, pay and any attention anymore. Um, I, think, I think we're paying more attention because we're dealing with the fact that we didn't pay attention 10 years ago. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to escape and come back. Yes, well, we have a panel here at 11. 11, yeah. Thank you. Oh, terrific. Thank you. Uh, Hi.